I'm good. So we wrap up Frankenstein or Frankenstein. <laughs> Until I'm, I've got young Frankenstein on the mind, calling it Frankenstein, right? We wrapped that up last week, so this week we're doing the great gothic novel Dracula, at least the first, uh, roughly the first third of it. That's kind of what I assigned for today. Um, so I'm definitely going to be interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. It's a little different than Frankenstein, especially the way it's written. Yeah, I mean, what what to say about the book? So the book is, as I mentioned last week, the book is written in what's called the epistolary form. This is what you call an epistolary novel. And basically that means that it's a novel that's written in letters, in diaries, in correspondences, and things like that. So rather than this time, rather than having one narrator kind of tell you the whole story you get the perspective of multiple people here i mean mul multiple people are telling you the story and you're kind of having to piece it together i guess i guess the book the book is pretty much all the characters at the end of the book compiling together all their notes right and then coming up with a book that's pretty much how the book is is structured so um, it's written in the 1890s by Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker was a pretty devout Irish Catholic. He was very conservative for his time. Um, you know, you wouldn't think that with this book. I mean, he, he was very much a staunch sort of religious conservative. There's been insinuations and uh, that he might have been gay, right? There, there's been lots of uh, speculation about that. I don't know that for sure, but the themes of this book, I mean, there's, there's definitely some, some of that here, right? So I'll be interested to kind of unpack that with you all a little bit today. But, um, if he was, he definitely would have never come out with it, right? Just because he was so staunchly religious and conservative. This was his most popular book. I mean, again, like Frankenstein, it's hard. With Mary Shelley, it's kind of hard to top this. Yeah, he wrote a bunch of other horror stories as well, but this one, this one pretty much tops the charts. It's now a staple of British lit especially the, the Victorian the Victorian age. So Colton says, uh, I read he was very homophobic. All right, yeah, so you're, you're right. You're right, Colton, he was. He was. So if he actually was gay, right, he was very hostile toward and ashamed of it. Right? And it was very uh, homophobic to others. This was the time period the Victorian age was actually the time period where these identities first started. So like before the Victorian period, like no one would go around saying like, I'm gay, right? No one would do it before the Victorian period. This is where having like a sexual identity started. So they did, the Victorians did it as a way of kind of other making, you know, anybody that's not straight, sort of an other, right? So, um, you know, like I said, this is the time period that started. Before, before the Victorian period, of course, you had, you know, people doing homosexual acts and stuff, right? But there, was, there wasn't an identity for it until the late 1800s. That's when people first started saying, like, I'm gay, right? Before that, they called it the sin of Sodom, right? So they just thought that it was just like any other sin that anybody might do. That's how the church kind of viewed it before the late 1800s. They called it the sin of Sodom. Of course, I, I, told, I might have told you guys before, one of the most famous people in history who uh, 
was guilty of the quote unquote sin of Sodom was King James the first of England, right? Who commissioned the King James Bible, right? So uh, now ne next time uh, you're in church and they say the King James Bible is the only version of the Bible there is, right? Just just remember that. Just remember that. All right, so uh, I've, I always find that amusing. But um, nonetheless, like I said, this was the time period where that type of thing started as far as identifying as gay or straight or a lesbian or bisexual or whatever. So um, this novel was... It sort of blew people's minds when it came out. Of course, we owe just like with Frankenstein, we owe it to the 1930s monster films as well for kind of bringing it to the mainstream, bringing it to popular culture. You guys probably all know the old Bela Lugosi Dracula film from the 30s, which just like with Frankenstein, it changed the novel around completely. All right. Um, Again, with Dracula, it's hard to come up with a good version that's straight up with a novel. But Dracula was actually, this book's actually based off of a real guy, right, who lived in Transylvania in the Middle, Age, in the Middle Ages, right, Vlad the Impaler, right, who was known to be like this barbarous, like ruthless sort of military leader. So it's based, Stoker based this off all off of him. The, there was a real Dracula. Count, there was a real Count Dracula, right? Because we don't, probably wasn't a vampire, right? But you know, it's, this is based off of a real dude. So there's lots of ways we can dive into this text. We can talk about the structure. We can talk about vampires in general. Like we haven't really talked about that in this class yet. We can talk about the gender and sexuality stuff. We can talk about what happens in the first third here, especially with Jonathan Parker and Dracula in the first 50 pages or so. We can talk about the exotic locale of Transylvania, right? That's kind of, I told you guys last week, um, the Brits tended in British lit, you know, they tend to look at people other than Brits as like exotic as others, right? When I, when I say the word other, right? I mean like you're excluded, right? So you're outside of the realm of Anglo-Saxon culture, right? You're, you're an other. So uh, there's lots of, of that going on here, right? There's lot, especially with the people in Transylvania, right? They make them out to look superstitious and, and uh, simple and not too bright and things like that here. So um, lots of stuff we can talk about to open the novel. So I'll just open it up. What was your guys' uh, hot takes on Dracula? Like even, so what was your hot take on the book? But even like what types of, things in pop culture are you used to with Dracula? Like what kind of types of things have you seen even? So we can kind of start this conversation out the same way we started talking about Frankenstein. So what's your guys' experiences with Dracula and even your experience starting the book? I think it's really easy to read. I thought it was gonna be really hard but it's actually pretty pretty easy compared to what I thought it was going to be. It's like, um, for me, I get all these different settings and kind of, I don't want to say theme because that's not what it is, but the feeling you're supposed to get while you're reading them. Um, the different letters provide me. But it's really easy to keep up with what's going on. There's nothing like jumping too quick. And once you learn the characters and learn who they are, it got a little bit confusing when Lucy was naming off all of her possible husbands and I got kind of confused with who she actually loved and all that stuff. But 
other than that, I, I like reading it so far. I think it's pretty, pretty fun, which I'm listening to it. So it could be the difference in uh, the narrators because it's got this audio book I'm listening to has like five or six different narrators for each person. So, and I, I love the, the, the guy from Texas, the cowboy, you know, that guy that was, they, uh, when you're talking about how they look at everybody else as kind of outsiders, they even painted the guy from Texas as exotic kind of in a way. Right. I like that, but his, his uh, narrator in the audio book was, was perfect. They have like, a Texas voice. Oh yeah. Big time. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Cause like, you li- you listen to, you know, 60, 70 pages of, of, of a British accent, and all of a sudden you hear a Texas guy come in, and it's it was just wild to hear that different. It was wild to hear a different voice other than Jonathan's after a while. So I thought that was pretty cool. What about the rest of y'all? How's it going for you so far? I thought it was kind of like harder to read. I, I thought Frankenstein was easier to read because it's really just from one perspective. I've kind of been hopping back and forth between summaries and the actual book to kind of keep up with whose point of view it is. Did it start to lose you right around the time that uh, was mentioned a sec- that Colton mentioned a second ago, like when you start when all these new characters start getting introduced and whatnot? Yeah, when it jumps from like, uh, John Harker, or whatever, to the Mina girl, I kind of, it kind of started losing me. So I kind of went to the some reasons, kind of trying to figure out what I just read when I read the Mina's point of view. All right. So that's around the part of the book where you start. That's the part of the book where you get introduced to all the characters, pretty much. So um, luckily, you won't get too many more new ones after after today i think it's harder to read than frankenstein but i'm enjoying it more why why do you think you're enjoying it more i don't know yet maybe just the way that the author wrote it i I just enjoy it more i'm enjoying it more because it's leaving a lot more hanging for me like i know what's going on but at the same time there's not like this you know, constant dying, somebody's dying, somebody's dying, somebody's dying. There's a lot of suspense building up. And you left us on a massive cliffhanger, by the way. I didn't read past where you told us to. And that last little line of, you know, you need to get here quick. I was like, ah, come on. Up. I know, right? I know what I'm doing. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, know, I know. Go ahead. I was going to say something. I didn't read past our last meeting. So I have no idea. Right. Um, but anyway, um, Dracula has been, I can't stop. I can't stop listening to the audio. I can't stop, put, I can't put it down. I'm even falling asleep to listening and reading. I'm doing both at the same time. And I think this way I'm getting more out of it, which means I'm, you know, I'm like following in with that. Like I'm not following, falling into it. If that makes any sense with the author. So you're, you're listening to Dracula this time, like, like Colton. Yeah. And I'm following along with it in the book. Except when I'm driving or picking up my son, but um, I bought the audiobook and everything. So when I do sit down to read it, I have the audio going and I'm reading along with it like we did in like school. And I don't know, like I think it's given me more suspense than if I would have just read it myself because it's a different understanding for me. And um, I really like it so far. Which of course I'm not where we're supposed to be at yet, but I'm slowly getting there. I'm a, I'm one page from chapter five. Now you're a good ways in. You're about where uh, Jonathan Harker gets out of the Castle Dracula, right? That's kind of where you're, kind of where you're at. Yeah, he's spotting Dracula for the key, even though Dracula's in a slumber. 
Oh, he's trying to bust out of there, right? Anybody else initial thoughts on the reading experience of, of Dracula so far? Or the listening experience even? I'm like everybody else, I guess. Uh, after you learn the characters, then it's easy to follow. But whenever they start introducing like these different, like a different storyline and characters, like it was hard for me to know who who I who it was that was telling the story but I also liked that you know with Frankenstein I felt like there was just kind of like a steady storyline then this story is it's like it can go in like a different directions of we're talking about you know uh I forgot the guy's name it's in the lunatic asylum and Dr. Seward. Yes. And then you have, you know, the different characters and their storylines, Lucy and I don't know, it's, I like it that it's different, um, telling a different, different story, but same story. I, can, I don't know how to explain it. Right. So you, you kind of like it how you get different perspectives on the story right so kind of like you're getting the truth based off of different people people here right that's what i was going to say too i like the different perspectives of it and being able to see what this character thinks and what this character thinks and then trying to connect it all together of okay how does this relate to the story as a whole how is this going to end I just realized my name is Tierra Adkins on our class. <laughs> By the way, that's my daughter. I'm on her laptop. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Yeah, so I like I liked a lot like they were talking about how it's three different stories. There I guess you could probably break it into four different stories, really. Um, kind of converging all into one because it's like they're not all seeing the same thing, but they're, you know, they are, you know, like, like Seward's dealing with Renfield acting all crazy and stuff. And he sees the bat and, you know, he runs out and, I, and this might be speculation, but when he breaks out of the asylum, he breaks out of the mental, mental institution. Does he run out to the place that Dracula was talking about purchasing? Mm -hmm. Is that his? Okay. I, I, that was a strong assumption on my part. I was like, well, he ran over to an old church. And I thought that that was probably, you know, he was sitting there talking to him. And then you got the stuff going on with Lucy. She's, you know, dealing with her sickness. And that's related to Dracula as well. And then you got Jonathan's story where it's directly happening to him. Like, he sees everything that's going on. He knows that it's all nuts. And then his memory kind of gets wiped of it. Not wiped of it, but he, he's mad. So everybody's seeing different things that are all, important to the main part of the story but it's not like they're all seeing the same thing from different points of view it's just little pieces of a puzzle that was cool kind of remind me of, of the way that have you ever watched the witcher on netflix yeah it kind of reminds me of the witcher in a way except for the witchers like the timelines are on different you know stair steps and then they all meet together but you know the witcher it's three different stories that are all really, really related and everybody knows each other and everybody knows what's going on, but little things are happening to converge together with this one big thing. So I guess that's how it's going to turn out. That's how I assume it's going to turn out. Right. Yeah. All the characters will eventually kind of interact and they form almost like this pact after a while where all of them kind of group up once they all figure out what's going on. Yeah, the with the Witcher was a good was a good uh, comparison there. Like even the way that the story jumps back and forth in time. Right. So like from the from this transition from Jonathan to Mina, right? We even kind of like jump back a couple of months. Right? So the way the time works in the story is is interesting as well. Yeah, it's it, uh, it's just like in the Witcher. Whenever I was 
watching it. I got to like episode three and I was like, what the hell's going on? I had to stop and Google it. And then I realized it was all on separate because it doesn't really tell you in The Witcher that everything is on a separate timeline. Where at least in Dracula, you have your letters and journals are dated. So you can kind of follow, okay, this was right, this was before this. So this hasn't happened to Jonathan yet. Or this hasn't, you know, she hasn't made it to this place yet. And when I watched The Witcher, I was like, I don't know what is going on right now. I'm kind of scared that I'm, I've missed a big piece of it. And then I Googled it and realized that I was supposed to be kind of confused. But it's an amazing show. If anybody hasn't watched it, you guys need to watch it. It's incredible. Okay. episode one it's it's tough but like it, one two and maybe three are like really hard to get through because of the confusion but once you get through it man I, it's probably one of my favorite netflix series it's got a really gothic feel to it too everything's mm-hmm. really dark and and eerie that's what drove me to it but i got confused yeah, it's a good uh, book and video game series as well I just started playing the third game. I'm really excited about it. I bought it last night and downloaded it. I'm super pumped to start playing it again tonight. I have the, the, the third game is one of the best games ever made. I think it's 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 good some up there. Good. All of you guys are getting into it then. Um, yeah, like I said, this. I think this is the gothic novel of them all. Because Dracula's kind of got that place in our pop culture. Where have you guys watched a bunch of like Dracula films or encountered the character before in other media that you can think of? There was one really old Dracula that I'd seen. It was black and white, and I feel like it was silent. And like his fingernails were just like really long. I almost want to picture that he was bald, but I, I can't. I can't think if that's what it was that I was seeing. And like his his face just looks dif- disfigured. Like it's not like a today's vampire of what I like the fangs or whatever was like just the two front teeth. And- was it this? The Nosferatu film from the twenties was it was it that you that you're talking about, Tiffany? That's the one I was associated with, Dracula. That's the one I watched. The only, the only thing I can think about when I see that guy's the SpongeBob episode. I don't know if any of you guys have seen it. But <laughs> it's, I think oh it's yeah, Ashley and Slasher one where he's flickering the lights. He's like, "Who's flickering the lights?" He's like, "Nosferatu." And that's all I think of when I see that dude. Was he the fir- was that the first vampire? Was Nosferatu a book as well, or was he? Uh, Nos- Nosferatu is a direct telling of Dracula's story in the 1920s. So the 1920s was the silent film era. Um, okay. This movie's really spooky to watch. Like, there's no sound, so like it's really it's really darn creepy. It's it's an expressionist film. It's German expressionism. So like it, it's very eerie to watch. I would get I would recommend it. But um, there's only one copy that that survives of that film because they made that film without Bram Stoker's estate permission. So they actually like sued. Like you stole their story, right? So. The fact that we even have this film today is, is kind of remarkable. So, I mean, rightfully so, right? They stole the story without permission, so of course you could sue. Right? But um, you know, we, we still have that. Then we have uh, Bella Lugosi, Dracula, who is still he's still like whenever we think about movie Dracula's right he's still the guy right I am Dracula right that he's kind of got that voice like he he very much popularized the role in the 1930s monster movies so um, at the Hotel Transylvania Dracula boys yeah that's him that's him 
You watched the cartoon movie, The Hotel Transylvania? I haven't watched those, no. Now, y'all make me feel young. Was it Adam Sandler did his voice in that? I think so. Yeah, he did, he did a great job, too. <laughs> but uh, but well, was Dracula the first big novel that had anything to do with vampires? Or first novel period? I mean, I know that there's probably, you know, like, I'm sure there's ancient, ancient origins behind vampires and what they are, but was that the first piece of work? As far as I know, yeah. Right. Um, the first novel that took up the subject, like they were alluded to in other stories and whatnot. But this novel is what made the vampire kick off right into, into the crazy. Mainstream. Like what all it started. I mean, I think we wouldn't have Empire Diaries, Twilight, True Blood, like all that modern day stuff if it wasn't for Hebrew Rise and how cool it was to make some art out of it. Does it, it, don't spoil it, but does it get into why he can control the wolves? Does it ever tell anything about that? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I'm really excited to hear about that because, you know, obviously, like, I guess the, the idea that most people have are that wolves and vampires are enemies just to, due to Twilight. And right. <laughs> yeah, he's out there waving his hand around telling them to stop, and they're like, oh, okay, cool, and tells them to come, and they come. So I was kind of wondering about that. Yeah, they can turn in, they can turn in the wolves and bats or, or uh, rats. They can also turn into rats. So, like, a lot of these creatures that Renfield likes, right, they, they're associated with vampires. I was based on my assumption when I came in to reading Dracula when, when the werewolves came in. I was, I was thinking of, like, Underworld, where they're, like, arch enemies and then when he got to the part where he pretty much tells them they can come or they have to go I was like wait what they're they're his and I, I had to like rewind and listen to that like twice because it was it <laughs> I pretty much done a backflip in my seat it like blew my seat over I've heard of Van Helsing a lot too and then, like, I didn't, I, I had no clue that he was a part of this novel. So I thought that was cool. I just randomly, when I was listening to it today, I heard his name pop in at the beginning of one of the letters, or when, maybe it was whenever Seward mentioned him that he was going to write to him. But I heard that and I was like, oh, that's neat. Yeah, doc, Dr. Van Helsing, we haven't really gotten to him yet in the book, but he is Dracula's sort of arch nemesis right? the, the one who he's the one who kind of you guys will find out he's the character that kind of puts it all together what's actually happening so he's he's a man of science and um he's a meta he likes metaphysics but he's also a scientist so he's kind of this weird blend of a scientist and a philosopher in the book As, but, we, but we'll talk more we'll definitely Touch more on him next week when he becomes part of part of the book. Yeah, they made the they made the early two thousands Van Helsing movie with Hugh Jackman. Right, you guys might have seen that. That was kind of like an action movie. So, um, what, what what who else like? How, you guys watched it? Any of the other guys watched any of these old films, or uh, what are you even like besides Dracula? Like, what other vampire medias have you consumed? Like, I'm sure some of you all did grow up with the Twilight stuff. I'm probably not wrong in saying, right? Or the Vampire Diaries. Or, or Vampire Diaries. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. What was the movie? Um, it was in the 90s with Brad Pitt, and he was a vampire. Was Tom Cruise in that one too? Yeah, the interview with the vampire. Yeah. yeah, I love that one. I like Supernatural and like with the vampires. Ain't you watch that? 
Oh yeah, yeah. Supernatural. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the interview with the vampire, those come from a bunch of books by Anne Rice. Anne Rice writes a lot of like vampire stories. And they're usually like romantic type characters in it. Kind of like how Twilight is. Uh, Anne Rice is a little bit of a better writer than uh, Stephanie Meyer, right? But we won't, we won't, we'll leave it at that. Yes. I wish I had Stephanie Meyer's money. I'll, I'll just say that. I, I wish I had her money. Yeah, the, right now, Dracula's kind of back in the mainstream too because the Castlevania show that was on, that's on Netflix. I don't know if you guys have watched that based on the game series. But um, that's a popular Netflix show right now, too. Was that the one that you said that the same people that made the Haunting of Hill House? Is that the same people or? Same. There's a couple of different media. There's a couple of different shows that are out right now. Um, Castlevania is kind of its own thing. It's a it's an anime looking show. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Castlevania. Okay, I didn't know you were talking about an anime. Yeah. yeah, I've never watched it, but I've I've seen it before. On there. Yeah, there's there's also a very good Dracula show on Netflix, just called Dracula. You guys have watched the Sherlock show. The same writers who were behind who were behind that did that, and that's a three part mini series. So if, if you want, they take liberties with the novel but it's still pretty cool i would recommend you guys check that out if you're digging the story the first episode kind of takes us through where we're at in the book so um the first two episodes rather probably do so yeah check that out that's a good telling of the story my, there's my favorite film adaptation of Dracula is made in the 90s, though. It had um, Gary Oldman who played Dracula, Keanu Reeves with Jonathan Harker. Keanu Reeves isn't very good in it. Right? I love Keanu. He's not too good in that movie. Then you got Anthony Hopkins plays Van Helsing. So that's mean and uh, Winona Ryder plays Mina, so that's that's a good version. It, that version is called Bram Stoker's Dracula. So if you guys want to watch a film, I recommend that one. So good. I mean, we're just kind of see even the monsters, right? You guys mentioned the monsters of Frankenstein, right? But even the Grandpa and the monsters that's based off of. Uh, of Dracula. So a question a question that I have for you guys is what do you guys think is so in, like what, what is so interesting about vampires? All right. Like what why do you think we're compelled to these vampire stories? Like people in the 1890s just kind of blew their minds. Especially like trying to make vampires romantic characters and stuff what do y'all what do y'all why do y'all think we're so as a society we're so fascinated by these creatures i think it's the idea of immortality right yeah explain more taylor why do why do you why do you think the immortality thing's compelling because as humans or the human race we're Death is something that we just don't fully understand. It's something we're scared of. And the thought of being immortal, you know, never dying, like, I feel like everybody wants that. Well, most people. Right. Yeah, death is the thing we all fear the most. Right. So vampires are kind of a way out of that, I suppose you can say. 
I mean, okay. the what if, like, what if vampires are real? Like, or if they're just an imagination? Like, it's one of those you got to think about it things. <laughs> I think well, that's where I was going to go with it is that there's you, you wouldn't know because they can walk around in society without even. I mean, aside from the sunlight, I guess, but they don't, they're not like your typical monster. They're doing the things that monsters do, but they're portrayed to be beautiful and to be exquisite and, you know, intellectual. And of course, you would be after living for centuries, um, but they're not your typical monster. So they can be romanticized. It's kind of like the, they're, they're like the, the Ted Bundy of, of monsters like you know everybody looks at ted bunny like oh he's this normal dude but he was a psychopath serial killer and i think it's the same thing with vampires like oh they're all pretty and they're all well camped they're not running around stinking and smelling bad and living outside in the woods you know dracula's got this massive castle and they all look pretty normal they you know, they live like humans do other than the fact that they drink people's blood now, in the Vampire Diaries, all the vampires, they have special rings they have to wear, so that way they can go outside in the sunlight, so you wouldn't even really know. And it makes me wonder, if, like, if there was, like, what would be their supernatural powers, or would it just be what, you know, the mainstream media has always portrayed it to be, you know? they can't go in the sunlight or I can't think of any of the other things like garlic and the silver bullet and the wooden steak and I'm thinking of Buffy the vampire slayer right now but <laughs> would they really have those powers right well this is a good you're kind of leading us down a good path here what are the rules about vampires that we all know, right? She just, she just named a few. Onions, garlic, or is it onions? That's no, just garlic. 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 Crucifixes. Um, can't go out in the sunlight. They have to drink blood to stay alive. Um, they have, most of them have supernatural strength, speed, and. Silver allergy. Regenerative health is one too, right? They can, you know, regenerate really, really easily. Bats. Uh, What'd you say? Bats. They bats. some reason got something to do with bats. Do they sleep in their coffins or do they sleep upside down? Like, because I've seen that portrayed two different ways. And I've seen some not even sleep at all. And Dracula, he sleeps in his coffin. But um, I've seen it other ways too. Where they're kind of like perched like a bat. Nowadays in vampire shows, like they're not really as monsters like they used to be. <laughs> Like, they're all really, really pretty, and they do normal things most of the time. <laughs> right. Yeah, they, they set the pretty vampires, right? They, they sell. They sell. Right. I mean, that, that's, one re <laughs> that's one reason, right? The, the, this idea of the romantic vampire sells books and right? sells movies. And we've any you guys can't admit it. I won't judge you, but are any of you all Twilight fans in here? I'm a massive Twilight fan, man. Are you? Are you? I love I love it. I love the series. Me and Caleb have watched it like two or three times since we've been together. We love it. It's I was getting ready to mention, I think that the, the Volteri is like takes you back to that Dracula feel compared to what the Collins and you know just your Typical vampires are just living, bouncing around from place to place. When you run into Volteria in the movies, you're like, okay, these guys they kind of portray what a vampire would look and act like in their big dark robes and their red eyes, typically. And, you know, they're real stern and cold, super smart. And then the columns are like your modern day vampires where they're 
sweet, nice people. They, you know, they feed on animals, bounce around from high school to high school. They're like the romanticized version. I enjoyed. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, I remember whenever it first came out, I was, you know, it was like a big thing. Everybody was getting into the Twilight movies, and I was like, "What is it about?" And when I found out it was like about vampires and stuff, I was like, "Really? I would never, you know." So I didn't actually get into the Twilight movies until after they had already all came out, and then I kind of. Uh, hated myself because I didn't watch them sooner because then I did fall in love with them. Yeah, they've, they've become a part of their pop culture, right, to, to say the least. The books are pretty popular, too. She just released a new book last year, I think it was, or this year. Yeah, it's from the vampire's perspective instead of Bella's perspective, isn't it? Yeah. It's the same story, but told through the, his perspective instead. But you can see where she got the name for Bella, right? Bella Lugosi, the original movie Dracula. So it's good. Uh, you know, they're definitely creatures that um, fascinate us as, as a culture. You guys forgot to mention the house entry rule. Uh, you, got, you guys know the house entry rule? You guys know what I'm talking about? You have to oh, give yeah. them. I completely missed that. That's, they have a um, uh, vampire diary, I think. Do they? Do. I think. Don't it want a house entry, like they have to have permission before they can enter your house. Yeah, they do in the vampires. Yeah, they have to have your permission to enter. In the book, Dracula tells Harper, he says, enter here of your own free will. Right. So like I, I thought that was interesting. Like how he even beckons Harper and says, come in of your own free will, right? The darkness, staying out in the dark and all that stuff, that's an interesting uh, motif. Like some writers let them stay out in the light. Some of them don't. Um, I think in Dracula, I think we'll find out. I think he can go out in the light, but his powers are, are weakened. Uh, I think that's how it works. Some stories he'll just melt. If, you, if they go outside in the sunlight. Colton mentioned uh, the, crucif the crucifix, right? The crucifix kind of repels them. That's, a, that's interesting. That's something that we'll talk about the further we go too. Because the, a crucifix isn't just a cross, right? It has Jesus's body on the cross. Right? The crucifix is a Catholic symbol. Right. You don't see Jesus on the on the cross on a Protestant cross. Right. A crucifix has the body of Christ on the cross, and that's kind of what repels Dracula or repels vampires. Right. So it's the cat. It's the Catholics who can scare. Drac vampires off. Right. A normal cross won't do it. You have to have the body on there. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Catholics and Protestants. Um, forget, I forget which story it was we got into that. The differences, right? Catholics are much more, I told you guys before, the Catholics are much more about pomp and ceremony in the church, right? Part of that is with symbols. One of the reasons one that was one of the reasons why Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church was he didn't like the symbols. He thought that they were 
they were idols, right? So the, the figure of the crucifix, you're getting away from the worship of Christ because you're worshiping the idol, right? Which is the symbol. So um, I don't know if you guys ever noticed the difference between crosses in that regard. I never did until you mentioned it when we was, I think it was, uh, uh, was it Mr. in the back, the, the black veil? Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. I was talking about that, but I never had before. Like I never knew the difference. Um, I just thought that, you know, somebody had put Jesus's body on one and, you know, there wasn't one on another one. Like it didn't make, it made more sense when you was talking about it. Why, what does, does it ever, like, I keep wanting to spoil, so if you want to ask you stuff about the story, then it's probably going to tell me, but is there a reason, does it tell you in the story why the crucifix is bad, or is it just uh, something left for your mind to ponder on? No, they don't explain it, they just, they, in the book, they just know that it repels them. Yeah, I guess, I mean, people, I guess that drives you to a conclusion that they're demonic, that vampires are inherently you know, demonic or of bad nature because a crucifix wouldn't do anything if something didn't mean harm then you know crucifix wouldn't repel it kind of story but uh so that means that they have to come down from lineage of demons or, or satan himself because yeah. and then you can always go to that line of like they're that they're demigods that vampires are kind of demigods in a way that they could be like the offspring of angels and humans. Is that called the Nephilim? Right. And same thing as like giants and, you know, all those things. Giants, Achilles, Perseus, like all the stories in Greek and Roman mythology. Demi gods. Yeah. Yeah. You could, I guess you could. You could say that they're uh, just a different different type. I mean, they could have very, I mean, the way the story is told, they very easily could have been a descendant of, they could have been their own little culture out in, you know, Transylvania. And, or, or does it does it mention in the story that they're from that region? That's where they're kind of, I guess, is there a history that gets told at all? Or is it just, is that left up the imagination? Are you talking about like Dracula's origins? Yeah. Yeah, he, Van Helsing will later talk a little bit about it. Good. <laughs> yeah, the later in the class, when we get to the research paper, I'll actually have you guys read an article about. Christian symbols in Dracula. Like it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, man, like I said, a normal cross doesn't do it. It has to have the body of Christ on it, like, a, like in the Catholic symbol. So, um, well, that's, that's plenty of intro. Let's kind of dive into the novel now, kind of break it down a little bit. First thing I want to bring to talk about is Jonathan Parker's journey to the castle, right? I kind of want to bring that up. There's lots of description of Transylvania, right? This, it's this big mountainous region, supposedly lots of natural beauty, but you have all these old castles, gigantic castles from medieval times that are kind of rotting and in decay and things like that that's that's kind of like the gothic whenever we talk about like gothic architecture right the gothic extends the architecture as well there's something that's fascinating about like gothic architecture the big castles right even uh, you see things like gargoyles and things like that right what do you get? What's so fascinating about 
all these old medieval castles and stuff. Like, why why has that kind of thing become associated with gothic? Do you think you guys have any ideas here? It's always in a Eastern European type setting. Because of the way the architect was, it's it's old, dilapidated. Mm -hmm. um, in some stories, they don't even know when it was actually built. And that just makes the perfect scene for any horror, scary movie, book, anything. Come on. Okay. Okay. I think that it's I think that style of architecture is really threatening like the way that it's all, it all comes up to a sharp point and there's always almost like bars on the window the doors are always massive it's really intimidating so I think that's got something to do with it just it's really pretty but it's also really intimidating I guess that vampires are the same way big doors like sometimes there's like a drawbridge like leading into the castle all that type of stuff yeah th that's architecture we can't relate to ever in the states especially right like our history just doesn't go back that far so i think i think that's compelling to americans at least right but, we don't really have architecture like that here. But compelling the, the Brits as well, though, right? The Brits did have a lot of these old castles and estates. For some reason or other, they were always, they always associated this with Eastern Europe, right? So Hungary and, and uh, like where Transylvania is, Romania. Right, well, that's the area they associate mostly with with that stuff. And that's when it comes to Christianity. That even goes beyond the Catholic Church. Right, that's once you get that far east, that's where the Eastern Orthodox is the biggest uh, church, and they're they're definitely known for a lot of these uh, big buildings and whatnot. <laughs> So I guess we saw that before with Lovecraft, right? The rats in the walls. So we 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 have dealt with that thing in the class before. But um, yeah, it's definitely worth bringing up. But what do you guys think about how Jonathan Harker, how he kind of paints the people of, of the area? And do you guys think they paint on the simpleton? He paints on the simpletons and dumb and all this stuff. And you're saying yes, Colton. I think he paints them as simpletons, but he also paints them as people that, like they, they know what they're talking about. Due to like in their, it's like the same way that people paint hillbillies. Like we, you know, we, we're painted as these as these backwoods people that don't know a whole lot. But if some hillbilly, if you stopped and asked some hillbilly for directions, and he was like, "Yeah, I would not go up that road." Or if he, like, handed you a pistol when you were getting ready to walk off into the woods, you'd be like, okay, this guy knows what's up. He knows I'm getting ready to get attacked by a bear, you know, or he knows that something bad's up here. It's kind of like he it, he made them smart to – as smart as they could be for where they were because they, they did – he painted them like they were really um, community-driven people. Like, when he first got there, they were all kind of, like, walking around and, like, discussing with each other why he was there and then they were really really nice to him you know they gave him the the garlic they gave him the crucifix so not that they're like savages or anything but they're not scholars right very superstitious type people right he's he's a man of english right he's a man of science so uh, going to this place where they're handing him a crucifix right he's like okay right that that's new i'm not used to this so um, all right well, what any other thoughts here what do you guys make of the way that he painted the villagers leading up to castle dracula 
wasn't he like disrespectful to like because somebody gave him that cross and he was a uh, angelican or something? Yep. He definitely seemed um he seemed judgmental towards that person for sure. And he kind of seemed judgmental at the guy that led him to the castle, wasn't he? When they like kept stopping at every flame. Right. Yeah, that, that actually was Dracula, right? Leading him to the, the castle. Guy right, the guy right before that, the guy that let him off at the um Oh yeah. They were kind of making him feel dumb too, though, because they were like, We'll take you, we'll bring you back in the morning if you want, and like kind of like he was crazy or something. As you, you're exactly right, Ethan. He points that he points that out. Like, oh, I don't want this. Right? This this isn't even the Christianity I subscribe to. Right? We don't carry these crucifixes around. Right? So he's he he's a little he's a little snobbish, right? In, in a way. Yeah. Why didn't he when when he offered him the brandy and the carriage? Why didn't he take that? He said why, and I can't remember. Does anybody remember? He said that he just liked that it was there. He liked the comfort of knowing it was there. He didn't want any. That's, that's pretty much what he said. Yeah, I thought it was really cool how hospital, like hey, there was so much hospitality from Count Dracula, but there wasn't like, I mean, he's definitely grooming him up, but. I thought that was neat how he gets in the carriage and there's a bottle of brandy under the seat and he doesn't take any. Yeah, the whole blue flames on St. George's Day. I thought that was an interesting little part. I think that's, you can see all the buried treasure, where all the buried treasure is, but nobody will go out because that's when all the evil things are running about. It's kind of like how Halloween is, right? The idea of Halloween, right? That's the one day a year where evil spirit or or the spirit world kind of crosses over with our world, right? It's kind of the same kind of thing here. So what was the point of putting a rock next to like this blue flames? That was to, some people tried to put rocks to, to go back to the place later, right? So they could find it later. That way they would know there's no wolves around or whatever. But um, as Dracula said, most of the time they can't even find their way back to it. Right? They tried to mark the spot, but it didn't, usually it didn't work out. So would you take your chance, right, to go get a million dollars, right, but have to fight off a bunch of wolves and stuff to go get it? Um, that, that's kind of that, that was kind of the game they played there. Why did when when he described the the ride to the castle, he kept mentioning that it seemed like they were going around the same turn and back down the same road. Were they actually, or was that just something that was supposed to be kind of supernatural? Um, I don't know what, how, what to think about that. Um, it seemed like he that night to Harker seemed kind of like almost like a fever dream in a way, right? Yeah. Dr Dracula kept stopping and going to the flames and he thought he imagines Dracula look like commanding the wolves right so he, he becomes almost a very unreliable narrator in that part right because it definitely feels fever dreamish it reminded me of, of when just like the lovecraft stuff when you know like the the geometry of the place where Cthulhu lives it's it kind of reminded me of the same thing like maybe it was something to do with the entry to the castle maybe you had to do that or something along those lines it, it definitely kind of throws them off in the sense that he doesn't really know a clear escape path right? because his whole path of getting there was so 
disorienting. We do know the gypsies can go there. The one Dracula has a bunch of dealings with the gypsies who go there. Gyp gypsies are also painted as others here, right? They, they always have been. I mean, like even in, with like the Germans in World War II, right? Gypsies were um, part of the Holocaust too, in addition to Jews. Right. So gypsies have always kind of gotten a bad rap right, for being superstitious and others and things like that, too. Any y'all watch boxing? What is it, Ethan? You watch, you watch, you ever watch any boxing? Like, it's been a while. The uh, there... heavyweight, happy the heavyweight champion's a gypsy right now. He he fought uh he fought last Saturday. I didn't know that. That's cool. Well, some of the uh like my my favorite. I completely forgot about it earlier. I don't know how I forgot, but my favorite show involving vampires is Hemlock Grove. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that, but the gypsies in Hemlock Grove are werewolves. So I don't know if that's got some kind of correlation with it or not, but. If you guys haven't seen that show, you need to need to watch it. It's incredible. Yeah, if you watch the original Wolfman movie from the 30s, like it, it comes from the werewolf thing comes from gypsies and that too. So there's there's a correlation there. Yeah, I don't I don't know why the Brits always gave gypsies a bad rap. Right. There's there's something uh, the fact that they don't settle down, the fact that they're kind of nomadic and travel place to place for some reason or other that upsets Western Europe sensibilities. Right. Because we're all I mean, people in the Western world mostly lay down roots somewhere, right? They buy a house and start a family. Gypsies don't really do that. I well, they're they're typically minimalist too, aren't they? So right. there's not really any kind of control factor. So, you know, you raise the taxes, what's the gypsy going to do? They're going to pay the same amount of taxes they're paying now because they, they're just going to dip or they're not going to work. You know, they usually can do without a lot less and be happy. So there's no – you don't really have much control over them. And if you make them mad, they just pack up what little they have and they leave and they're happy about it. So that's probably why, you know, in these bigger civilizations like in – England that they, they weren't real happy about them being there because they couldn't really control them. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Yeah, they're, they're oftentimes the women, gypsy women are seen, you know, like they're, they dress all exotic and stuff too. So we're definitely, this is the main difference between American racism and like racism over in Europe. American racism is always dealt with African Americans or, or Native Americans for the most part. Right? Over there in Europe, Europe, they abolished slavery a lot sooner than we did. But their biggest issue was colonization. I mean, like the Brit, you guys might have heard the phrase before the British Empire, the sun never sets on it. Right? That's how it was in the 1800s. But the Brits conquered pretty much the entire, what the, almost the whole world in the 19th century. And that phrase was true. They conquered India, right? They didn't, the in, India, their colonization of it ended in until the 40, 1940s. It might be the 50s. I don't remember. It's one of the two decades. The Brits conquered China in the 1800s. They did that by getting the Chinese addicted to opium, right? The, the British are the biggest drug lords in history, right? Because they pretty much got all the Chinese people over there addicted to opium. So there was actually, there's actually a war from the 19th century called the Opium Wars, right? So a lot of like ideas about Orientalism, about especially like East Asian people, a lot of that stuff comes from the Brits, right? Because of 
because of that, right? I'm, I'm briefly alluding to this last week when I talked about Frankenstein, the suicide at the end, because that was a Hindu, um, pretty common thing in Hinduism. So, yeah, th this is the big difference, right? You guys can, you guys get a little bit of flavor, different type of racism here, right? This is the more British flavor of it. You know, there's actually there's actually a way of studying literature now called post-colonialism, post-colonialism. The way that we're kind of breaking down Dracula here, talking about this stuff, that's the type of thing that post-colonialism examines. And it looks at like how literature has created like a lot of these stereotypes about different sorts of people, like gypsies or or people from India or, or Eastern Europe, Eastern Asians. Right, so you don't see that in American lit too much, right? That American lit, we have our own problems over British lit. This is that's very unique to them. I am by no means an expert on this stuff, though, because I study American lit, right, for a living, right? So. I'm pretty much telling you guys pretty much all I know about it because I'm not an expert in that field. So we should probably talk about sexuality in the book. All right. Vampires are associated with, with sexuality, right? There's, there's something. We didn't quite get into that a minute ago, but there's something inherently sexual about vampires in that regard, right? The fact that they suck the blood from the throat, right? Which is, that's very much an erogenous zone, right? For, for most people. Um, we mentioned all the, the gay subtext in the story, but... Um, Dracula keeps telling the, the brides, right? He's I'm keeping them for myself. Right? So there's there's a bit of that going on here too. And so th there's always an insinuation like when a vampire sucks the blood, right? It's almost a very sexual thing, right? The exchanging of fluids and whatnot. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. So. There's there's a lot of male praise in the book too, like from Lucy. You know, they all talk about how lucky they are to have a good man in their life, and like how how she felt so bad for turning three other dudes down, that, or two other dudes that proposed to her down. Like they, it's it's like he paints men very very much more superior in this book than he does women. You, you think he paints Lucy as kind of... Uh, yeah, or something like, well, yeah, a little bit. and But it's, it's really, really odd, too, how, like, I don't know if it's just a common thing back then, but, like, they're all, they're all friends. Like, all the dudes that were going to try to marry her, they're all pals. He's writing letters to this guy, and he's like, yeah, I'm going off to see my dad. Uh, go over and check her out. And you're like, if this guy has to marry my girlfriend and then I'm going to go have him take a look at her, I'd find another doctor. No way. But, you know, and, and they all really cared for her. And she, she's, she's definitely like the, the hot chick of the story. You know. No, nobody cares about Mina. I mean, she's yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's she's locked down. I guess I don't know if that's <laughs> the way to put it. But and then and then she's the one. And Lucy's the one that gets sick. You know, she's the one that gets attacked by Dracula. I guess is you know I'm assuming that's what happens. Very clear assumption now. But she's she's like the the main focus. She's the damsel in distress as well. So it's. Yeah, I would say that she is promiscuous. 
What are, what are the rest of y'all think? Does Lucy get around a little too much? Or or does she let them men off gently? Right? She says she says she tries to let them off gently. Right? She gets a thrill out of three guys proposing to her in one day, nonetheless. I kind of think she like likes the attention a little bit, really. That's what I was gonna say. I mean, what female honestly wouldn't like that attention? Right. She said she definitely she, got it going on. Right. She said she says she doesn't tell anybody about it because most females would want the double that, right? So three guys proposed to you in one day, most would want six. Right. So that's kind of what she says at one point. Now, if you ever watch films of Dracula and stuff, she's often painted that way, right? She's painted as being very flirty. She, she doesn't shut these guys down, right? She, she's accepting of their advances. That's oftentimes how it's, she's painted. Even with what Colton said, though, like he said, like, men are painted in this story, like, it's greater than women. Like, you like, because Dracula is kind of, like, manipulating her. Like, he has her sleepwalking. He's a... Don't they like, don't vampires have the power to like like mind control powers? Yeah, like, mesmerism. Like, yeah, he's kind of like uh, manipulating her into like sleepwalking. And, I mean, I thought like, that's what he's doing. With that Ron Field guy too, ain't it? And he kind of paints Dracula right. with, uh, as a male. It paints him as like the most powerful person in the story. Do you think that the fact that Renfield's crazy lets more um, like? There's more light shed on him of what's going on. Like the fact that he's nuts, Dracula lets lets him in the door a little more. And that's why he's calling him his master and why he's, you know, saying that he's going to serve him and he's going to bless him. You think that his psychoactive brain has allowed Dracula to say, okay, I can let this guy in a little bit more because he's nuts. And if he says something crazy, no one's going to believe him. Right. Yeah. I I think that's part of it, right? Renfield's a means to an end. Dracula. I think, I think I'm not going to spoil it, but uh, I think you're going to see like the same thing through Lucy that you see through Green, Greenfield later in the story. For being honest, how so? Ethan? I don't know. It just seems like because he Dracula's manipulating both of them, right? Like he's in control of both of them at points. I just feel like eventually, I don't know if Lucy's is going to end up that bad, but because when you get he, he she obviously got bit by a vampire, so she's going. She's gonna turn into a vampire at some point. So I just I don't know how it's gonna go. Whether she's whether there's any hope for, her or, or if she's gonna end up being just as crazy as because the Ryanfield guy a vampire too, or is he just is he just nuts? He's just nuts. I don't really know where it's gonna go with him really. That was another. That's that was why I raised the question of the origins too, was because it, it makes me wonder, like, you know, are these people going to die, or is he just sucking them completely dry of their life and then making them live in misery, or is he going to turn them? Because you know, a lot of vampire stories you can pick and choose who you want to turn. A lot of stories it's hereditary. Um, a lot of stories it's everybody that gets bit by one dies. Period. So it just makes me question, like, what the what the whole motive is with this small group of people other than just, you know, because he could just go out and drink whoever's blood he wanted to at night and just frolic around doing it. But I feel like there's definitely an end goal where the story would kind of be meaningless. So I'm, I'm with Ethan. I think that there's some kind of bigger plan with those two in specific. I don't know. Yeah. And, of course, I, I don't know. When it left off, I, I, it's been so long since I because I took like a three day break. When it left off with John, with Harkin's journal, the last thing that he did was that I remember him doing was striking him in the head in the casket. And then what happened after that exactly? He pretty much just jumps out the window and hopes for the best. Okay. 
So he wasn't was he he wasn't bitten then, right? Nope. As far as we know in the story. So he just went mad out of pure like just biology. Like he just went insane because he had been through so much trauma. So that's yeah. Everybody else, because I know everybody else is acting a little different than he is. Their their memories aren't locked, they're just acting weird. You know, Lucy and then Renfield, they're both just acting kind of odd and out of the norm. Yeah, the women, the women vampire is almost like Harker, but Dracula stops them, which which is interesting. Why does he stop them? I mean, that was a real erotic part of the story too, because like he even mentioned how he kind of wanted to kiss him. You know, like I want to get too dove down into it, but it's like it's almost like something you would see off of a dirty movie. You know, three three vampire chicks walk into a room while you're laying there asleep, like. That's definitely painted as erotic, in my opinion. That's that's what the author was trying to get across. Was that he was like, oh, "Okay, this ain't so bad." Yeah, they breathe heavy on his neck, right? One of them gets down on her knees, right? So that that was a for a Victorian novel, right? That that's about as dirty as it gets for a Victorian novel, as you guys know the. Victorian age was the age of manners and respectability, right? This is when women were going around wearing corsets, right? right? So um, this this was about as, as raunch as it got for them. Of course, they did have pornography and stuff in the Victorian age too, right? But it was it was hard to get. <laughs> But tying this back around, right? Um, what are you? What about what about Renfield, right? What What do you guys think? Is Is he nuts? What's the one on with this whole thing he's doing with animals, right? He wants to breed flies and then give the flies to um, what, what? What did he? The rats, right? Then. He wants the birds to eat something, right? So he's kind of got this whole food chain thing going. Uh, he's trying to consume as much life as possible. It's like if you give, uh, you know, if you give a chicken a hundred worms and then eat the chicken, it's a lot yeah. easier than eating a hundred worms and then a chicken. So I think he's just trying to consume as much life as possible. What do you guys make of this character so far? I mean, Col- I think Colton pretty much explained explained it. But, um, any thought? Any thoughts on him? We're getting we're getting a big another with it, with this character. We're all getting a Victorian depiction of an insane person too. All right, this is. This is a time period, too, where you started to see things like institutions spring up, right? You know, only in the Victorian age do we start getting, like, insane asylums and stuff. So the way that they paint the insane is interesting here when, when you think about it that way. A lot of, like, the bad way... Victorian insane insane asylums, right? They were weren't very pleasant places to be. Lots of abuse of the patients and neglect and things like that, right? Here in West Virginia, we have a famous one in uh, in Weston, uh, which was built in the late eighteen hundreds. Have you guys ever been to that? The one in Weston. Yeah. No, I want to go. Do you enjoy – do you do the tour at night, Ethan? No, we did the uh, haunted house. Uh, it's like the haunted house thing they have there. They, they, it's kind of crazy, though. Like they got, like, people running around on stilts, at, like, when you're waiting in line. It's probably the best haunted house I've been to. 
Yeah, they'll let you go in and pour it at night. And like you hear all like all these noises and stuff. Yeah, that ain't that not locked in there for not being in there. <laughs> you're not going you're not going near that. No. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I went into it at night last year. Um, like there's it's it's pretty creepy stuff goes on in there, right? I mean I'm pretty, I mean, I, stu I study this type of stuff. Like, I'm, I'm teaching a golfy class, right? But there's, there's some pretty cra crazy stuff goes on in there. I mean, this is where they did lobotomies to patients. I mean, when, if a patient was unruly, they would just cut that part of the brain out that dealt with personality, right? It, it was being in one of those places was almost like being in a hell at, the, at this time period. So, um, have you have you watched the series Nurse Ratchet? I love I love the source material. I haven't watched it yet. I love the source material it comes from. Uh, uh, one it came from one, yeah. See, yeah. I've never watched that, and I, I've always wanted to. It's just like. The older movies like that, I have to really kind of buckle down. Like, all right, I want to watch this today because it's tough to get past older film quality. But I thought that that, that series was a really good because that was in like the I think the fifties was when it was based forties fifties, and it seemed like hell being there then. So I can imagine the late eighteen hundreds when they were first starting to pop up everywhere, how scary it would have been. Because you didn't have the medicine. You didn't, you didn't have as much of, I guess, the typical sedatives and stuff that you do now, the correct dosages and, and everything. So, like, somebody started acting nuts and screaming and hollering and everything. There wasn't as easy means to calm them down as there is now. And we didn't have the trial and error process that we do now. We didn't have the laws that we do now. So, it probably was living, like living in a dungeon. Yeah, let me show you guys this. Um, Victorian insane asylums were designed in this way. Pull it up here for you on Zoom. They were designed in this way. Um, they were called a panopticon. A panopticon. This is where, like, the warden. Like, it's kind of like when you go into the store and you know that the people behind the wall can see the shoppers, right? See to check for sh shoplifting and stuff. That's pretty much how the Victorian insane asylum was built. Like, you had like all these cells, then someone standing here can kind of like observe all the patients in their cells, right? So, really, the patients never got any type of privacy or anything like that, because they were always being monitored in their cells. And you know, they, they call that the uh, a panopticon. So, so did uh, they ever come out? Yeah, they would, they would take them out to use the bathroom or uh, for, for exercise or stuff like that. But for the most part, like they were stuck in these little cells and some were constantly observed like they were lab rats. So, you know, there's a, um, there's lots of books on this subject. One of the great literary critics is named Michel, Michel Foucault. He wrote, he wrote a lot about these, about this subject. Yeah, but it, it's an interest. Like they do the, they still have panopticons. Like I said, like if you go to the mall, right? There's usually a uh, like workers can usually see what the shoppers are doing, right, from behind the wall. Right? So that's that's what the idea of the panopticon is. Yeah, we got Seward's Asylum here, right? We kind of get the insinuation of Renfield's the smartest one there, 
right? So there's a, they always talk about sanity, like who's insane, who's sane. Like they say that sanity is the consensus of the majority, right? Well, what if the consensus of the majority isn't right? Right, so maybe the insane person is really the same person. And so that, that's kind of like what the what's going on in Dracula here. Right. What what do you guys think about that idea of sanity, right? Sanity. We define sanity by the consensus of the majority. Right. What, what do you guys think about that? There's a kind of question, right? I think it matters in, in what regard, you, you know, what you're talking about specifically, you know, because. Let's let's say for instance, let's say for instance, uh, you have like a blue lamp, right? But so the consent the consensus says that it's that it's blue. But let's say that the let's say that the act the actual color is is green, right? So you can kind of see where I'm going here. Like the insane person says it's green but the consensus says it's blue, so it's blue. Right? And then you're insane if you think it's green. So you can you kind of see where I'm going there. Yeah, it's one of those like stone thoughts or shower thoughts or something, you know, like stuff you, <laughs> you don't you don't need to think about, but your brain still makes you. But it, to me, it's I kind of run along the lines of like it, it just it, it kind of, whatever your perception of reality is is what's real to you and that's the only thing that matters so that's why I don't I, I think lumping yourself in with the majority is bad in the first place and that's probably why people get declared insane so many times is because they, like human nature is to follow the majority but you know just like the guy just like Renfield if everybody would just hear him out for a second they'd probably figure out what's going on really quickly even if his intentions aren't good, they would still figure out the facts instead of just declaring that he's nuts. So you're kind of you're kind of agreeing with this, like right? you're saying the definition of sanity is the majority, right? Whereas, yeah. Unless you have a different uh, worldview, like in the sense that you know if that nobody's really sane or nobody's really insane. But everybody just has a different perception, and some are stronger than others. You know, there's some people that are completely stagnant. That just take they they don't look at anything through a different lens at all. So you could declare them the most sane person in the world because of that, because you always seem to look at it on the other end of the scope of like, you know, if somebody's really, really insane. You never look at it as like somebody's super, super, super sane because they're so serious and they're so black and white. You always want to look at people that's seeing all these crazy things that nobody else is seeing. And the people with without imagination, are they insane as well? Because they're so, you know, fixated on what we think reality is. And it just, it just matters what your worldview is, you know. Like I would have, I, would, I think that's an important part of psychology is to hear a person out. Because if you're if you're looking at it from a standpoint of somebody's in a mental institution, it's because of something that's hardwired in their brain the wrong way, and there's nothing you can do to really change it or overcome that. So you have to hear them out and understand why in the first place. So I think that's why you know, like that's why Seward gives him more sugar when he asks for it, and then. He was going to offer him to have a cat or a full grown kit. You know, it's kind of like he's toying with him. He's not really just like letting him out and doing whatever he wants to do. But he's also trying to understand what's going on in his head. Yeah, Seward is very forgiving, right? And curious about, about, his, about his case. He's probably pretty unique in that regard. 
Yeah, yeah, I think he's got a good understanding of where he's at, you know, like what he's supposed to be doing as a doctor in the story. Because a lot of doctors, when he escaped, they were like, to hell with you and threw him in a hole and like let him live out in there forever. But even after he escaped, he came back and still took more, in, more interest in him after he escaped. Once he figured out that he had that religious mania that he thought, and he mentioned something about, okay, one day he'll probably think that he's a god. He still continued to study him because uh, it, I don't know if it was care for his patient or if it's his love for his field. But, you know, I think that in the back of somebody like that's head, they have that thought of, is he really insane? Or we all, just like you said, you know, he don't, maybe he don't want to pair with the majority. Maybe he wants to figure out what's really wrong with this guy or what's right with him more than wrong. Yeah, it kind of goes to like schizophrenia and stuff, right? A schizophrenic patient might see things, right? Everybody else doesn't. So that's why that we say that person's crazy, right? Because everybody else doesn't. If that person does, so that re their reality is valid. Right? That's how they see the world. Yeah, interesting philosophy stuff there, right? what what is reality even right is it is it reality the consensus of the majority i may have asked you already have you watched donnie darko mm -hmm. that i think that's a good one if you're asking yourself that question i think it's a good movie to watch because in that movie he doesn't really exhibit the typical psychopath behavior like the outward behavior that you know violence and yeah, all that stuff, but you see what's going on in his head. And it kind of makes you wonder, like, maybe we're maybe they're getting a different type of oxygen than we are. Maybe that's why you ever heard that that old joke? It's like, what if what if oxygen's really what's keeping us from seeing all these things and the government's controlling? It's like a conspiracy theory, like massive, massive thing. But it makes you wonder about stuff like that. Uh, any of the rest of you guys have any thoughts on this? Jake, Jacob, you're usually very philosophical. We haven't we haven't heard anything from you. What's what's going on over there? Well, I, you know, I I haven't read into the book yet, and I've just been kind of taking it all in. Um, one thing that I did want to throw in is whenever you were talking about him biting on the neck, how it's romanticized, but it's it's also very primal. You know, you think about most predators, and they go for the neck. Um, that was just one insight that I had. Other than that, I, I do love Twilight. Um, I, I probably shouldn't, but I do. Uh, <laughs> I do have four kids. I've watched Hotel Transylvania and all the cartoons. Um, I, I'm excited for it. Like I said, I got like 20 minutes left of Frankenstein. Um, having a ball with it. It's been busy. I'm trying to juggle everything. Cole, what, what audio book are you using for Dracula? Maybe you can recommend it to, to the group. It's a free one, baby. The one on Audible. If you, well, it's not free, but I stole somebody else's Audible account. Um, but if you get an Audible account, it's like, I don't know, $5.99 or $10.99, just typical subscription charge. A lot of those old classics, like Frankenstein and Dracula, they're the ones that are a part of like the public domain and they're included on there. And that's what I really liked about this one was that it had five different, five or six different narrators. So it made it a lot easier. That's why at the beginning of class, everybody was like, yeah, I was kind of jumbled around. I was kind of jumbled around. That's why I think I wasn't as jumbled around on the characters and what was going on was because there's a huge distinction between going from listening to Jonathan Harker and all the other characters. Like when it got to the, um, but what was the old man's name? You remember the old man that sat on the bench with him and talked with Lucy and Mina? Can't remember his name. The guy who speaks in the funny accent, though, the Welsh accent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So imagine that in an audiobook, listen to it. Because I listen at 1.2 speed because I try to get through it as quick as I can. And, but if you go up to 1.3, 1.4, then it's like listening to gibberish. So I got to, I was on 1.2 speed, and then this guy pops up and start speaking in this accent. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I had to rewind it like five times and crank it down to like 0.9 speed because the, the guy, he really 
embodied that accent. He was taking it serious. You couldn't understand a word of what he was saying. And I had to slow it down and listen to him. Um, but that's uh, that's why I like it. I think it was – let me see here. I've got it pulled up. Um, I want to say Tim Cook was the guy that was over it. No, Tim Curry. Tim Cook's the guy from Apple. Tim Curry, Alan Cumming. And Tim Curry is it Tim Curry the actor? It could be. There's a lot of these audiobooks that have famous actors reading them. Like one of the free ones on here, it had um, I guess Audible teamed up with some people. Like Jake Gyllenhaal narrates some books on here. His sister, um, I can't remember her name. Maggie. Maggie Gyllenhaal. Yeah, she she narrates some. Um, let me see if it gives. Okay, how? I've got it here on Audible. Um, it's Tim Curry and Susan Dorden and John that's Lee. It. John Lee, Graham Malcolm, yeah. Stephen yeah. Crossley. Yeah, that's that's him. It's uh, he got in what's called an audio award, I guess. It's a award from Audible. It's multi 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 voice performance. It was recorded in 2013. Um, got like five stars well thank you for that i hadn't really looked into a one for dracula yet but i used audible it's, awesome. it's great yeah. it's really it's really good too when it gets to like um the part of the book where they're talking about the ship coming in oh yeah we haven't even talked about that was that how dracula got to how what was the whole point of that ship that's is that how he got to london that's right funny eventually okay I, I assume that but i definitely i wanted somebody else to confirm it before i had to google it i like that part of the story though i thought that I thought, was neat i thought it was cool how the captain's body was still like holding on to the crucifix yeah tied to the and yeah and tied to the wheel the wheel yeah that was, that was pretty dark stuff and then the dog jumped off was he the dog that that makes sense mm-hmm. now that makes sense that's awesome they said it was like it said it was like a, um, a wild dog looking. Something. I think it said something like that. Yeah, I didn't put that together until we started talking about his relationship with the wolves. But I like that part. I like that part of the story when I was I was cutting grass and listening to it, and uh, just the they did a really good job painting the setting in that part of the story with the stormy skies and the waves and and yeah, it definitely puts you there right up, right out there on that cliff looking at all of it. I think that's another one of Dracula's powers too. Like he controls the weather like that. So he's the one who brings in this big, like tempest. That's almost like a hurricane. I mean, he, Dracula's who does that. He can control the weather in that way. That's not normally a power you hear with vampires. I mean, but that's one that he has. Uh, he can control the weather. I think in Twilight, it kind of correlates a little bit whenever they go play baseball and, like, whenever the storm comes on, they don't – don't their powers get enhanced. Like, they start playing baseball a lot harder. <laughs> it's kind of corny, but that's a, I guess that's a piece that they took from Dracula and said, let's incorporate it. Yeah, later, later, I think there's a report, like – was it in this part where it talks about the wolf breaking out of the zoom and all that stuff? That, that'll happen later. Dracula will break a, a wolf out of the London Zoo. I think that was in chapter 11 because I went ahead and read like one of the was, was that in 11? Yeah. yeah, you guys got lots to look forward to for, for next time. We'll get Van Helsing and introduction to him. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to divvy it for next week yet. Right now we're 120 pages in, and my copy of, of my book, and there's 380 some. I might just have you guys read the next third for next week, and then we'll talk some writing stuff too. I think that's where I want to do. We'll discover Dracula over three weeks. 
Yeah, because I think cramming all the rest of it in the one week next week would be too much. Yeah, we'll we'll do the next third next week. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you what chapter to end on. I need to look look through it and decide. Yeah, we'll we'll read the next third next week and maybe do some other stuff too. Okay. I think that's probably enough for today. I think we got a pretty good intro to the book here. Let me uh, write down everybody who's here. That's real quick before I let you guys go. Don't forget, I'm not Sierra. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, most most of the normal band is here today. Yeah, since we're just reading the next third next week, hopefully some of you guys are a little behind, might uh, get caught up. I will probably finish up where we we're supposed to be at today, sometime tonight, and then I'll start reading again tomorrow. They just, I just got an email. They canceled basketball for tomorrow, so that'll help a lot. <laughs> Right. I, I just realized Tim Curry was the guy that played the original Pennywise. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense that he'd be into the gothic horror genre. And I said, did he have something to do with Rocky Horror Picture yeah, Show, too? He was in that. Yeah. He, he was in Clue as well. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense now. He does a good job, though. I don't know who his voice is in. I, I would assume several of them, probably Jonathan Harkin and Dracula. It doesn't say on the app though. He's got the he's got a very unique voice. Uh, I'll have to check that out. That recording. I think you can get Audible as part of Amazon Prime, don't you? Or, yeah, mm -hmm. so I should have. Yeah, that. That's good. All right, guys. Well, I got everybody. So it was a good class. Like I said, early next week, I'll have your papers back to you, so you'll you'll see how you did on that. We'll talk. We'll talk some writing stuff next week as well. So um, yeah, you'll get those back. You'll see how you did. If you don't do as good as you hoped, don't despair because I'll give you a chance to do a revision on it. So um, we'll see how we'll see how you did. So you, you'll get that back next week. All right. uh, enjoy the next third for next week. So until then, guys, take care. We'll see you all later.